Hello and welcome to theCUBE Pod episode 45. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We're here for 45th podcast. This is the podcast we go up and review what we've been looking at. It's the beginning of the year. It's not even the end of January yet. And there's so much going on. Dave, great to see you. I'm here in the Boston office again. Awesome to see you, John. <laughs> A lot going on. Actually, there's some news we're going to get to that happened after our podcast last week around Microsoft and a big cyber security challenge from the Russians. But Dave, a lot, a lot of stuff going on. Cold weather in Boston, but you know it's heating up for the beginning of the year. We're seeing a lot of action going on, and uh, you know it's it's been it's been incredible. A couple of things we're going to run down real quick, and then we'll get into it. Um, the AI FTC uh, interchange around generative AI. You got the FTC probing big tech's AI investments. Agencies looking into how Microsoft, OpenAI, Amazon, Anthropic, Alphabet are affecting competition. I mean, this is, and by the way, NVIDIA is not included, but we talked about last week on the podcast, the idea that these more investments coming from, you know, Microsoft, ADEP, Amazon, Google, NVIDIA, okay? Not so much anybody else, but those big whales are investing in, so we actually talked about last Friday, Dave, remember that? Um, they're actually coming off that news. And so there's been a big focus, certainly since Sam Altman left OpenAI, what's the impact? Are, is that the big guy's going to take over the impact of AI, the generative AI wave? That to me is the, is, is the question in the industry. This is just out of bounds. Let's save it for the rant section, but we're going to come back to the, the, the AI, generative AI, the FTC getting involved, terrible trend. The other big news, Apple's App Store, uh, breakup in the EU puts a crack on the whole walled garden of, of App Store. They have to change it for regulations in Europe. Again, more regulatory issues. They have to change how the browsers work, how iOS apps work. And it's earnings season. We've got more earnings next week. Rob Hope's all over that. And the Silicon Angle team are, are still tracking this. We track all the earnings. But Dave, I want you and I to riff on this. I know you've got a lot to share on Intel and IBM. And obviously last Friday, Microsoft had the midnight blizzard, which was not was a trivial hack that actually got into their system, was reading emails of all their top executives and they had their way for a long time. They had to disclose it and they did it on late Friday because of the new law around, you have four days to, to notify the SEC around that and they've confirmed it was a Russian foreign intelligence service that hacked every, everything. And then it's not even the end of January in 2024 and there's been a media meltdown. The broken business model of me, media, mainstream media is, is showing its head slow death becomes a fast boil here inside the media. LA Times, Pitchfork, Business Insider, Forbes, and it's still January, LA Times, 20% of its staff, most of its business and tech teams, Time 15%, Pitchfork, all of it pretty much, Sports Illustrated, shut down overnight, National Geographic, Business Insider, NBC News, tons of stuff. And finally, the ecosystem, startups, Silicon Valley, venture capital and private equity. Ed Sim and I had a podcast and CUBE conversation around this, this notion of investing before formation, they call it inception. Sierra, uh, a startup founded by Brett Taylor, who was at uh, Facebook uh, and Google, Facebook, and then Salesforce, um, raised $85 million with, <laughs> at a billion dollar valuation. He just even, he just started it. So that's his pre-formation. Pre He's also on the OpenAI board. And then Lightspeed Partners is selling stakes in 10 startups to get liquidity. Dave, it's insane. Earnings are here, and yet the market's great. Everyone's like, oh, look at the stock market, S&P at 500 at an all time high. So you can see it's not even the end of January yet. And you got the FTC probing in, the capital markets are kind of looking good on paper on the stock market, mostly dominated by big tech. Yet now FTC wants to get in their underwear and check everything out on share AI. And, and it's just so much going on. And still AI companies still getting funded. Yeah, I think when you look at, just zoom out and look at IT spending, tech spending, very much still tracking with the Fed. We exited the, the pandemic. People were thinking, oh, we're going to grow our budget seven and a half, seven point eight percent And then Ukraine hits, recession, you know, or, or inflation kicks in. Fed starts the tightening. What happens is all through 2022 and 2023, we just saw those expectations for budget increases dropping, dropping, dropping. Up until July of 2023, when the Fed stopped tightening, and that's when those expectations stopped dropping, but they stayed pretty flat. We ended the year okay, maybe three, 3.4% budget growth or spending growth in 2023 versus 2022, with an expectation that'll grow like four and a half percent in 2024, but it's all backloaded, John. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, Solipsky, Adam Solipsky, I invoke this line a lot because I think it resonates with me. We've seen better times, we've seen worse times, but we've never seen uncertain times. And I think companies right now are like, well, we don't really know. We're going to watch earnings, we're going to watch the Fed. So I think, and then there's AI. And AI right now, almost half of the, the companies report that they're stealing budget from other areas to fund AI. Okay, so there's not incremental budget. So what does that say? That says that unless you start to see real AI ROI, we're going to be in this tied to the Fed, tied to the economy, tied to earnings situation. What, once, if and when AI starts throwing off ROI, like people expect, then that will self-fund and you'll have gain sharing. But we're not there yet. And I don't yeah. think we're going to be there I in mean, the first quarter. I mean, we talked about last podcast. I mean, I think the generative AI thing this year is about productivity. And I think, I feel like this market is in a weird point because all the signs on Wall Street, if you look at CNBC, you're hearing people say, oh, the rising tide. I'm telling you, I'm feeling people, I think it's a lot worse than it really is on paper. Um, budgets are being cut. People we talk to are not spending as much. There's a cautious optimism. And if anything, people are pulling back. I think Q1 and Q2 is going to be very difficult. If you look at this expend on tech companies, and just in general, macro, if the tech companies are super the powerhouse, a lot of them are looks like they're pulling back, Dave. So I think, you know, I'm I'm nervous when I hear, you know, almost everyone I talk to is that budgets are down, we're cutting back. Let me uh, I, I'm really let me, nervous. Let about me that. jump in on this one because it's one of my predictions this year. So you know, I do my predictions with Eric Bradley at the end of January because we have the new data coming in, the new survey data, and you know, informs us. The second prediction was AI is not a tide that lifts all ship, uh, ships. I, I think that's a BS narrative. I think I think it's a very much a two-edged sword, as we're saying. AI is stealing from other budgets, so there's budgets that are getting impacted. So, you know, me too AI is a loser. It's a loser strategy. So you have to What do you mean be, by that? Mean, what do you mean by me too AI? If you're Explain AI that. washing, or you're just saying, hey, we have AI too, and you're sort of throwing, you know, bolting on AI, and you don't have the talent to actually drive it and innovate, then I think you're going to fall behind. And so I think, it, and so what we laid out, actually, we looked at about 660 MLAI accounts and said, okay, who's doing well in those accounts? The companies that have the most momentum, no surprise, Azure, AWS, actually looking pretty good within those MLAI accounts. Salesforce, ServiceNow, Databricks, Snowflake, CrowdStrike, Workday, UiPath, doing okay. Meraki, Cisco, you know, Google Cloud, Actually, Google Cloud doesn't appear to be getting as much of a tailwind, even though they're the AI company. Um, Cloudflare, you know who else is, seems to be high alignment with AI? Dell laptops and Apple laptops. Pretty amazing, right? Now, Apple's had NPUs in laptops forever. Dell's you know, talking about them, them coming, but everybody's looking for a big year in laptops, you know, including Intel, which we'll, we'll talk about. But then you got Cisco. We sat in on Cisco's tech talk for Silicon One, yeah. and they were making a case that it's tied to, to, to AI, or it's infrastructure for AI. <clears throat> I think Cisco could have a great story around AI, but they don't communicate it well. I mean, think about Cisco, they've got the full stack. They got Silicon, they got the infrastructure with the networking piece, they got the, the security, observability, they got collaboration, they have all the way up the stack to apps. And so they could have a kick-ass story around AI, but they don't put it, it all together. I think they're so stovepipe sometimes that story gets in their way. And I think AI has to be something that cuts across all the whole company. Not every department has to have their own kind of thought leadership. Yeah, they have to get AI in the product, but Cisco's a company. I can't put my finger on what their identity is for AI. And I think that's an opportunity. I think Dell has done a great job and we've covered them extensively, putting their finger on saying, hey, at least we're going to have laptops, we're going to have servers. I think Dell's done a good job there. I think, I think that's one. I think the real challenge on AI is going to be with Cisco is, are they going to be abstracting away the complexities around multiple clouds? And I think the super cloud equation is going to be, I think, a bigger thing this year than ever. And you know, if Charles Fitzgerald thought super cloud wasn't a thing in the past two years, I think he's going to be surprised this year when you see super cloud, super chips, super apps. Happen. Super startups talking so, super cloud. We, I saw <laughs> multiple startups actually quoting super cloud saying, we're going to be at the abstraction layer because if you can't run your apps across clouds, then you're going to have challenges on the operation side. So I think, and I predicted this last week on the pod and multiple pods before that, platform engineering 
has to be in place for this next generation. And there's not enough talent. And so the talent gap between traditional IT and super cloud-like capabilities will be an issue. And I think VMware is an opportunity there. We'll see if they can capture it. And again, like Cisco, so, they have the chips too, now at Broadcom. So, so come come back to the, the, the topic that we started with, which is AI lifting, yes. the tide that lifts all ships. You remember the internet, the dot-com boom. In the stock market, it was like, oh yeah, pets.com or whatever it was, you know, pets.com, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and everything was up, but but it was it was illusory, right? It was fake. And I think <clears throat> you're not seeing as much fake today. I think there's a bifurcated market. I think there are the AI haves like NVIDIA and the AI have nots like Intel. AI is everywhere. Why isn't it seeing it at Intel? Because it's not there yet. Okay, it's going to take a long time, and who knows if so it'll Ed, ever get so there. So Ed, Ed Sim, who I interviewed on the on on the Cube, it's part of our Cube, you know, series. He's a VC. He's at Bold Start VC. He invests. Uh, he said he thinks he said this quote: "If you're not thinking about how to leverage AI in your product, whether it's just a feature, maybe a new product offering, then you're insane." Okay, he thinks, uh, and then he then goes on and says that the 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 demand by enterprise to have AI tools are going to be r rapidly assimilated into the business, okay? And he's saying, he's saying well, it's not a product, it's everything. So he thinks AI, uh, like we do, that's it's, it's a disruptive enabler. So it's not so much AI as a product as it is, it's going to be infused into the business. And I think your, your conversation, when we talk about it, about productivity, it's, it's on point. So, okay, so where it will rise, the tide is, the tide is, the comp is business, right? So, yeah. so if business is the tide, they are their own boat. So I, I see this, this the metaphor off a little bit, but I would say that, you know, if if AI is here as a trend like the internet was and the web after, then it's just a matter of time before it becomes just part of the landscape. In other words, it's there's no AI company anymore. I think everything is AI enabled, and that's why it's a disruptive enabler. And the same exact thing happened to the internet at that, but at that time the big whales didn't have the monopoly power. I shouldn't say the word monopoly power, the market power that Amazon Web Services and Amazon Google and Microsoft have. So I mean, Microsoft just hit 3 billion in market, 3, 3 trillion in market cap. That's incredible. So- AI is lifting that boat. That's that's a big <laughs> freaking, well, it's their harbor. <laughs> the boats are in that harbor, it's Microsoft, but but that's going to be the question. I mean, obviously it's a good deal for the 10 billion that I haven't drawn down. Our, 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 our analyst emeritus, David Floyer, sent me some stuff this week, which I thought was useful, disruptions that are coming this decade. He thinks there could be a potentially 10 to one productivity improvement by the end of the decade. And he's saying the biggest hit in productivity is going to come from fully automated businesses end to end, new businesses that are formed that are developing processes from scratch, not paving the cow path. He's saying productivity from programmers is going to, developers going to improve, it is going to improve at least two to one by mid decade. He's saying a lot of this stuff is going to come from, you know, better use of analytics. And he's saying software, not people are going to be using those analytics. So, and it's new infrastructure. You've been talking about this. You were the first on top of this, that infrastructure is going to need to support this new AI, yeah. these distributed, these multi-clouds, these super clouds. So that's very different than the past, 30, 40 years, okay. right? And that's the problem that Intel's facing. And I know we're going to talk. Let's about get this. into it. One last point on the AI thing. I think that we're going to see a wave of wealth creation in, in our industry that we've never seen before, even in other waves. And I think Wall Street around the quote, Magnificent Seven, all the top tech companies driving most of the value, certainly got the attention of Lena Khan of the FTC. But I think that's just the canary in the coal mine as part of the hype factor. I absolutely see that generational shift of AI, generate AI, will be a game changer in the sense of how things are going to change from a power dynamic standpoint. The role of founders, you're seeing how they're funded. They're being funded pre-formation, Dave. You're getting, you're seeing an $85 million pre-formation financing at a billion dollar valuation. Why? Because Brett Taylor's on the board of OpenAI. Is that overfunded? Is that kind of overfunded out of the gate? So power dynamics are shifting to the founders. You're going to see productivity gains shift power to whoever captures that. So, you know, opportunity recognition and value capture is going to significantly shift faster pace, new players. I think new brands are going to emerge. You know, I think at, some, at some point, the tipping point here on the, on the tide shifting will be generational and you're going to see a whole new ball game. Let me ask you one last question. So yeah. the, Microsoft, Microsoft revenues grew about 20, 23 billion 
last year. Okay, we're going to see that when they announce on January 3rd. So let's assume it's 2023 billion. Mm -hmm. They trade at about 10 to 12 times earnings. So call it 200 billion of new revenue that translated into valuation. Okay, mm -hmm. but their valuation increased by a trillion yeah. this year. So people are saying there's a trillion dollars of value in Microsoft from just AI. Yeah. So let's say it's not a trillion. Let's say it's 750 to, to yeah. 800 billion. Okay. Would you rather invest in Microsoft because they got yeah. the AI chops, or would you rather invest in a company, we we're just talking about Cisco, where the AI is not built in to the valuation yet? And they've got the potential if they can ex execute and tap their ecosystem and AI innovation to, to get that value down the road. It's an interesting question. Well, it's a good one. And I think John Chambers had the famous line of companies can make that transition if they don't make that transition, that was his famous line in Cisco, made transitions. The question on Cisco is, can they make the transition? And I'm questioning that. And, and so I would look at that and that would be my big thing. Can Cisco, who's traditionally had under John Chambers leadership, made market transitions at the time they needed to make them. I have yet to see the tell signs from Cisco. Maybe I'm not looking hard enough, but from what I see, they have some elements in place, Dave, but I think they if, have the, all the, if, the, if the answer is yes, they could make the transition, it's a bargain. They're, the, they're Microsoft. Remember when we weren't doing the Cube Pod back when this was happening? But I remember, you know, when we started working together 13 years ago, Microsoft was trading around 26 bucks a share. Okay. So, so okay, do the math. They just completely transitioned. And I remember the moment they donated uh, when formed Open Compute. Satya Nutella started transitioning when Balmer handed them the keys to the kingdom. Boom, it was just a complete game changer. Microsoft made the transition. Amazon and AWS are in a similar position. Can they make the market transition to their business, which is retail and cloud, but mainly on the cloud side, which we cover, can they rein in and restructure their organization so they can capture that enterprise value even on the back on the tailwind of AI. And then a lot of people are skeptical. I hear people saying, I'm going to I'm gonna share, sell my stock on Amazon. You got people chirping about Microsoft not make, not continuing the growth. And then you got Google. I like Amazon, by uh, the way. I, I, I wouldn't be selling yeah, a seller yeah, on Amazon I mean, here. But, but so back to Cisco for a second. See, I think they've got the stack. You think stacks. We saw Amazon, Solipsky talk about their stack. We saw Satya Nadella at Ignite talk about the, the, the co-pilot stack. Yeah. Right, Oracle has got a very strong uh, AI stack, not the silicon level, but everything above that. Cisco's got every layer of the stack mm -hmm. and a lot of software yeah. content, and they're shifting. They are transforming their company. The problem is, I don't think they communicate it well, and yeah. they also, they don't have somebody, and this is, I think, in part why they miss cloud. They don't have somebody guiding that strategy. Yeah. It's very much sort of bespoke, to your point, about yeah. stovepipe, but I think- They need a chief AI czar. I think so. And, and I would say that Cisco- and somebody with credibility. Yeah. I mean, can pull that together. And it's very nuanced. And this is the question I would ask Ch um, um, the CEO. Chuck and, Robbins. Uh, Chuck Robbins and, and the team. Is your data available? Now, because you know the way routing and their switches work, it's at their customer premise, Dave. So you know Cisco, data and privacy, a lot of people are really nervous about how they leverage the data. I think maybe they might be handicapped here. So. Um, what I want to find out from Cisco, in fact, I will find out when I ask the question now that I, we bring it up, where's their data? Because I remember when we were at Cisco Live last year, we brought this up and they were talking about the role of data. Yeah. Now, if they have, now they have Splunk. Okay, so I think Cisco's sitting on a treasure trove. Yes, I the, think Splunk the, could be a, could help with that, there's, that challenge can, that, that you're talking about. Now, I, you're bringing up a good point. Their data is kind of locked into switches and routers that are on-prem. But if it's on the customer hit, premise, yeah. what's the licensing fees on that? What's the license on that? I mean, I don't know. I don't know. It's an open question. And I don't know the answer. I, I completely could be off base. But if they can get access to that, Dave, they'll have massive amounts of IP. AI is a data challenge and it's a data opportunity. Yeah. I know that sounds like a bromide, but if Cisco can tap that data, it's got silicon, I'm going to say it again, silicon, it's got the networking infrastructure, it's got cybersecurity, it's got observability, it's, it's, well, let, it's, got, let, it, it, it's got the collaboration piece, and we know G2 puts a lot of effort into AI there, and okay. it's got software on top I've always of that. Loved, I mean, I've always, I mean, I am a Cisco fan, just to, to kind of lay my biases out there. I've always said for, for decades, the fact that their network is so sticky 
You just can't rip and replace. The switching costs with Cisco are so high. Um, it's just, it's hard. They're so nested in there. And I think, you know, they, they have to do a better job and keep innovating. They are, we're tracking that there, but we'll see an earnings, David. Let's get into the earnings. Well, I, IBM and earnings came out. Next week, we got, um, you got IBM, SAP, Intel, ServiceNow, and that, that cert went out this week. And you got more next week. Uh, the big three of the cloud, F5, Supermicro, Alphabet, AMD, Samsung, Commvault, Qualcomm, Extreme Networks, Apple, Amazon, Meta, uh, Alassia, and OpenText. That's next big, week. Big week next and, week. And Microsoft, did you say Microsoft? Microsoft, yeah, yeah on, the on, the on the 29th, 29th, Monday. Monday's Alphabet, Microsoft, AMD, Samsung, Commvault, the 30th is Qualcomm, Extreme Networks, and then um, we'll see. I mean, so what do you, so we got some signs in, you got IBM in, you got Intel got killed, Certainly. IBM is getting it done. I mean, I mean, we talked about IBM in previous few pods. I mean, Arvin's strategy, I've always said, is very clear to me. You know, we got we got consulting. We're not going to shy away from that. We're fixing Watson. Watson X, actually, when you compare Watson X to some of these other you know players, I mean, I think it's competitive with Databricks with what they have. Uh, you know, they've got competitive with Snowflake, competitive with the the cloud guys. So Watson X, Watson got it right when I went down there at uh, the, the IBM research facility in Yorktown Heights. I tell you, I was really impressed. And then I did a, I did a breaking analysis with Tony Baer, Sanjeev Mohan, uh, uh, Merv Adrian, part of the Cube Collective. And I think I was very impressed that they got it right. They, 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 I think he's fixed the, the negative, you know, the, the problem with Watson. Now he's got to sh shun the negative perception. And I think that's happening. You look at the ETR spending data, it's doing quite well. Um, what really impressed me about the quarter was the free cash flow outlook. They're saying they're going to grow free cash flow by a billion dollars this year. Their consulting business is strong. Uh, they got the hybrid cloud strategy, which is you know kicking in, and they're 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 leveraging the Red Hat acquisition. So you're seeing these legacy companies come back in a big way. Um, I think Oracle's very strong. I think IBM's very strong. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with Dell with the laptops coming back. Um, we talked about Cisco. So IBM's okay, looking so let, good right so now. So let me ask you, so Charles Fitzgerald, our friend Fitzy over there, yeah. talks about the, the, the CapEx clowns. Um, he actually puts IBM in that category. IBM CapEx down 52% for the quarter, down 20% for the year. As with cloud, CapEx is the big IA, AI tail. Mm -hmm. Is that a factor? Is Does IBM already have the pre-existing CapEx or is CapEx a sign that they already have the GPUs? They were not relying on NVIDIA. Uh, does the CapEx give you any comfort that it's down I, when I, others are rising? I think Arvin, Arvin came in, I, I don't know. I haven't talked to him about this, but you know, I will when I see him next. Um, I think that he looked at this and said, you know, they got the hyperscalers. I'm not going to do what Larry's doing. I don't have the software margins and the free cash flow that Oracle has to pound all this money into CapEx. So rather than do that, let's leverage what we have. Let's rather, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some debt, spend whatever, 32, $35 billion on Red Hat, mm -hmm. leverage that and open shift to do hybrid cloud because there's clearly a need for hybrid, right? The whole lift and shift movement, that to me, that there's not a lot of juice left in that lemon to squeeze. Um, so let's double down on hybrid cloud AI, we've got the consulting organization to make all that happen where you need the pieces to be put together by, by services. And let's save money and not have to try to compete in those CapEx war, wars. So I think Fitzy's right in that they're not hyperscaler. And I think Arvin said, we don't want to be a hyperscaler. We're going to lose that battle. We missed it. Mm -hmm. So let's focus where we can make money, throw off free cash flow for the first time ever. IBM looks like, or not the first time ever, but the first time since Hal Masano, that looks like the company is going to have a sustained valuation increase, which is great news for shareholders. Well, I, I like IBM. I think the Red Hat acquisition was smart. I think the operating system for the internet is going to be up for grabs. And certainly the operating system for what AI will be, will be up for grabs. It's going to look completely different than the way we see it today. And so, you know, that's why this platform engineering thing is on my mind because not every company could be a have platform engineering. Some entrepreneur will build a super cloud interface so that developers can code faster because that's what's happening with AI right now. And if you look at IBM and Intel's earnings, it's the hardware and the chips are now the, the enabler piece 
that's now meeting up with the demand because the developers pushing hard on whether they're coding on a laptop, Dell and, uh, and HP or whoever, those chips got to support that, those models. And that's, the, that's my prediction that LLMs and the foundation models will be interacting and be, there'll be mashups. The power law that we talked about uh, uh, last year is in play. And I think people are going to have their own models and they're going to interact with other models, whether it's a neural network or knowledge graphs. And that interaction will be that kind of the, what if the API economy was for cloud. You're going to have the model economy for AI. And I think you'll see software built around it, glue layers, abstraction layers, bolt-on software and accelerators, hardware, software, all around it. So I think a new operating system and underlying heart and infrastructure will power it. So, you know, to me, we had a CUBE interview, I remember in 2017, the cloud's just hardware with middleware and applications. <laughs> Amazon's the hardware. Okay, well, okay, that's oversimplifying it. But today, all the top conversations are hardware, which is from chips to machines, and then configuring whether it's InfiniBand versus Ethernet, all these things we cover. And then middleware, which is essentially abstraction software, Dave, across multiple environments. And then ultimately apps sitting on top, that's what developers are doing. So the open source community is a absolute canary in the coal mine for where this is going. If you look at open source right now in AI, it is surging and it's, it's going to be a, a battle royale for you know, where the action is, hugging faces, saying they got the leaderboard, you got to have new things coming out. I even heard people talking about startups to be competing against GitLab and GitHub. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if people come out and use AI to replicate LinkedIn. So, you know, the question on all this, Dave, is what does AI disrupt and who leverages it? Because if you're Microsoft or Amazon, you don't want AI to rewrite Office. <laughs> you got to figure out, figure out how to keep it, you know, competitive. Um, and so to me, I think it's going to be another sideways years for, for, for seeing this, but we're going to watch it. I think leaders of, in markets, um, AI is going to confer advantage to those leaders, assuming obviously mm -hmm. they got to execute. I think ecosystem is really, really important in AI because there's so many other moving parts. You talk about legal concerns, governance, privacy. So you've got to have an ecosystem that can serve as a flywheel and can you know, fill Intel. some of those gaps. Intel, what's your take on Intel? Stock got hammered. Uh, analysts were on TV. Patrick Moorhead was saying on TV, oh my God, it's a, it's a rising tide. Uh, so you disagree with that. But I mean, Intel. Um, well, I said, I mean, I mean, AI I mean is he's every... trying to put a smiley face on Intel, but it was boom, it well, plummeted. Well, it, I mean, like I said, AI is everywhere except at Intel. Um, and um, everything's great except everything's growing except the growth businesses. I mean, it's just, it reminds me of, of, of I, IBM in the Ginny Rometty days where they had all these strategic growth businesses that weren't growing. And, and I think the big concern with Intel from an investor standpoint is their outlook is 15% below where people were expecting to hear. And, you know, Mobileye, which was a big acquisition, you know, Altera, Altera was a big acquisition. I mean, you're talking multi, multi-billion dollar acquisitions that just aren't paying back. And you know, they're hoping to spin some of these seeds out, as you know, and throw off some cash. And Intel needs cash. I've said before, Intel could go bankrupt. The problem is they're fighting a multi-front war. They're fighting AMD, you know, in their, in their backyard data center. They're fighting NVIDIA to try to get to the GPU game. They're fighting TSM and Foundry. I've never, I've never loved the foundry strategy. Tim Bajeran's coming on the, uh, uh, the breaking analysis in a couple of weeks, and he knows more about this than I do, and he's optimistic about foundry, but it's just so expensive. It's such a cash drain. Uh, uh, Pat's fighting China. He's fighting other merchant silicon vendors. Uh, and you know, this whole thing about five processes in four years, and it's never been done, and it looks like they're going to do it. Uh, that's all true, but so what? If you don't have volume, it doesn't matter. You know, they've taken this chiplet approach, which is smart because it's, 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 you get there faster and it's lower cost, but they're never going to get the price performance out of that, in my opinion, that you're going to get from, look at NVIDIA chips, you look at Apple chips, you know, the big, big chips, they're, they're going to get better price performance. They're going to get better performance. And so. Supply chain. They, What's the, how's impacting that? What's your well, take on that? I mean, I mean, you know, the supply chain in semiconductors, I think is, is, is misunderstood. The, the supply chain's never been global. In, in semiconductors, it's very isolated. You got EUV out of the Netherlands, you got you know, the world's top foundry in, in 
uh, Taiwan. You got the best software companies in Silicon Valley. And so there are these choke points. And this was, Chris Miller was, his book, Chip War, if you haven't read it, it's, it's outstanding. He articulated this. It's really not a global supply chain. It's like choke point supply chain. And this is where, you know, the U.S. still is very prominent in semiconductors, just not in foundry. This is why I, I, we need a strong foundry. But the problem is Intel needs cash. They, it's very hard for them, in my opinion, to compete both in the design and in the manufacturing. I had always said I wish they had spun out foundry, done some kind of joint venture and allow you know, the core Intel designers yeah. to spend the money on design. Now they got, they're going to get money from the US government, they get money from EU, but okay, what well, 10 billion is not going to move the needle. They're going to need a hundred billion dollars to catch up and compete. And I don't know where that's going to come from. Well, I mean, I think we're going to see how they respond to the market where there's, there's more horsepower needed um, and uh, a lot of competition. I mean, everyone's coming out. We see how the supply chain impacts it. You know, with the whole China situation, you know, companies like Lenovo, um, I've heard people saying, you know, we're not buying Lenovo because it's the of the supply chain from China. So um, I got I'm not sure how valid that is, but that's the that's the buzz. Again, we'll see. I mean, Pat Gelsinger has told us we got to be in the cloud, we got to be in the AI, and we'll see what they do. I mean. But NVIDIA, they're not in the discussion. Let's get into the FTC thing with AI because this transitions with-, with Well, just by the way, I, NVIDIA, to me, NVIDIA widens its gap this year. I just don't think all these you know, investments and other competitors are going to close that gap. AMD will get a little, little chunk of the market. I think Lisa Su said the market is 400 billion. You know, they'll get, I don't know, eight, 10% of that. NVIDIA is dominant and they're going to widen their lead in my opinion. I would not be- Again, we're not, don't take our advice. This is, we're not a stock channel. You got to do your own research. But I hear people saying, well, you know, NVIDIA, how much more can they, can they grow? You know, they're, they're, they're really rich. They're really expensive. It's for a reason. Sell. You know? I say sell. I don't. Okay. There you go. Make a market. <laughs> I don't. I would hold <laughs> NVIDIA. <laughs> you can for, take that to the bank. I would buy the dip on <laughs> NVIDIA. But you know, again, you gotta, we're not a, a stock. You got to be careful. Do your own research. Disclaimers. Et cetera, but can we get sued for saying that? I don't really I mean, know. What, why I, the I disclosure? So. No, we have to have that disclosure. Yeah, I think we should, right? Because people might say, "Oh, wow." I well, John I, said sell. John on the cube said sell, and I sold and it the last one. Dave shirt said buy the dip, and then you know the market crashed. So don't don't take our stock advice. You got to do your <laughs> own homework. All right. So Nvidia was not in this probe that the FTC and Lena Khan was done. Here's the headline. Hilarious. Here's the headline from the Wall Street <laughs> Journal. Um, FTC launches a probe of big tech's AI investments. Agency said it will look into how roles of Microsoft, OpenAI, Amazon, and Anthropic Alphabet affect competition, okay, in this red hot field. NVIDIA is not mentioned, but this came out of our story last Friday on this podcast when we talked about how um, these companies were um, specifically the big ones, Microsoft, Amazon, and Google, uh, and NVIDIA was actually in that list that we reported make up more VC investment than all the VCs combined. So they're number one. If you put those companies in one group, they're dominant, meaning they're influencing the market. My take on it was a little bit different than some of the uh, uh, CNBC and Bloomberg take, which was, which was more of, you know, um, are they trading credits, which we, that's a trivial, low, low hanging fruit, hot take. But if you dig deeper, our analysis was, besides the fact that they're getting credits for equity, which is a whole nother discussion, is it influencing the, the community? Because as these startups are going more inception, meaning funding to the point of, hey, Dave, we have an idea, let's start a company. And then, oh, the VC is just happy, to, I'll throw money at you. That's what's going on. The founders are more experienced in AI than ever before. And the younger founders that are coming out of school have some pedigree or experience. They're being found out in hackathons. So what's happening is the capital markets on the VC side are going after them early kind of like athletes trying to draft before they graduate college. So they want, okay, they're not ready, but I'll still fund them, I'll make that bet. That's how competitive it is. Okay, so that's the VCs. If the big guys are investing, is it market power, Dave? Do they just have access to what they're doing? Does it does it shorten that liquidity cycle? And now, oh, by the way, is the step up valuations like 
medieval in the sense of, oh yeah, I just started a company and then you got three days in and you do a B round at a hundred million dollar uh, of, of cash at a billion dollar valuation. Like that's what's going on. These valuations are insane. So you know, do you jump in? <laughs> Brett well, Taylor, pedigree, experienced, raises his hands. I'm going to start a company called Sierra. $85 million he raised at a billion dollar valuation. Never seen this before in my life at this level. Normally you see those step ups after some series A, but this is interesting. I'm on one hand, Lena Khan has no trekker with me, but I hate this move from a, from a regulation standpoint, but there's still a lot of attention. Is it good that there, this is happening? Well, so here's my thing. So uh, actually I, I love to rant on Lena Khan, but I think in this case, look, she's right. These companies have extensive power. I don't know what she's going to do about it. I would much rather see the government go to these companies like Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Apple, Meta, and say, listen, we'll back off a little bit, but you got to carve out some of your, your, your balance sheet. And we got to get the foundry business back to this. We got to get manufacturing of silicon back to the States. And okay, Intel here. We're going to do some kind of joint venture or something to take the pressure off you. We're Sounds like pour, socialism. We're going to pour money. No, it's not socialism. It's it's what China's doing. It's how do you think TSM? They're communists. But how do you think TSM? I know that's, I know that's terrible. <laughs> it's worse. But how do you think TSM got to where it is today? It's the government poured money into it. So I'm saying, keep the capitalism. But it, it, we need we need more subsidies in order to compete in silicon. And so I, I'd like to see Apple give its volume to Intel or some spun out, spin out foundry, but it can't because it can't get the quality. It can't get the yield. This is a tough, tough call. I, that might be- the Instead of busting their chops, like why don't they partner with them and do something that's good for the country? Is that free market economy or is that I'm, socialism? I, I'm a, I, I am a free market capitalist, but there are some markets which are so importantly strategic that you gotta, you gotta cheat a little bit on the, you gotta put your thumb on the scale for to get the government and the businesses working together or you're gonna get killed. And I'm not saying it's gotta be regulated, right? It shouldn't, shouldn't be regulated, you know, give them some guidelines, but then let the market take care of it. But you gotta pour capital into silicon or we're gonna lose. It's definitely gonna be a conversation worth watching. In fact, at Davos, what was hot there was the Argentinian speech where he talked about free market economy. And he says, we were once the largest, most powerful capitalist nation and then became the worst because of socialism. And what happened, people got complacent and basically saying the US is like that. Right that was now. an amazing speech. And, and that and Jamie Dimon's comment around Trump's policies, not Trump the person, he was kind of, he's basically saying it's kind of right. And he had no ax to grind. It wasn't, he's not pro-Trump. He's just saying, hey, look at it. We're a disaster right now. You got division in our country. Um, you got um, Trump's policies, which now if you look back, were actually accurate. Um, so, the, you know, in election, the election's going on, Dave. It's going to be very interesting to see what's going on. And I think divisiveness doesn't work, right? So unity, unification, it will, will has to be there for, for on the policy. I, I just would and, love and if, it, if, it, if it affects the chip business, we need a competitive it's, advantage and not be relying on other countries. Would you agree chips and AI are two of the most important strategic areas for the United States? Yeah. The long-term competitiveness. And so if that's the case, I'd like to see the government. And by the way, there are certain parts of the government that totally understand this, analysts and others, that, that and a lot of people in Congress understand this and are supportive of this. But then you got the FTC and the DOJ you know, attacking. So I, I'd like to see us all get along <laughs> and, and think about a, a, a 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 year plan to keep the United States more competitive. I, I think we have a lot going on. I think I want to see more faster chips. Chips will power faster applications, which is the whole middleware AI convergence. It's going to be fun. I mean, I, I think we'll see. Again, the, the, the action still continues to grow. Uh, earnings side, we, we just saw a bunch of earnings, IBM's results, Intel's tanked. But SAP soared, ServiceNow beat on all the metrics. Um, yeah, I mean, service I'm now. Chronosphere, um, one of our Cube alumni, when they launched, they launched on the Cube, they bought a, they bought a company. Um, Databricks, backing some startups. Um, you think Databricks IPOs this year? They, yeah, I do. I think they go public. I I'd, think, lo I'd uh, love to see it. I'd love to see, I mean, Databricks, Arctic Wolf is another one that, uh, that I'm watching that could go public. Um, yeah, of course, yeah. people talk about Stripe. 
you know, last year was really a crappy year for IPOs. Even ARM was the big IPO, and look at it's just like cybersecurity continues to be the two, no, the other hot area. AI and Gen AI and cyber super hot. Zscaler and enhanced their network security with zero trust architecture in their latest release. Um, single vendor SASE, the whole SD WAN market and observability. Dave's changing radically with secure cloud, um, and just in general, just there's a lot going on. Um, and the thing that's going to be interesting is the whole EU Apple thing. I mentioned that earlier at the top. They're splitting up their app app store to make it regular, make it make the regulatory regulators regulars happy in EU. Um, they got to change everything. So this puts a crack in the walled garden. That was from Jordan at CNBC. Jordan Nofoot said that, and he's right. The walled garden. Apple's always been this proprietary thing, and they've just been making so much bank. And so. Um, I don't see Apple slowing down anytime soon, but this does go against their their philosophy. So again, but, but they, a lot of regulation in Europe, a lot that could really be a problem. We'll see how that. But plays they did out. basically did a reach around on the ruling, right? Wasn't there a ruling said, okay, you've got to allow links to other yeah. websites, mm -hmm. and then they said, okay, instead of taking thirty percent, we're going to take twenty seven percent. I mean, really? All right. Yeah, so. more layoffs coming. We're, we've been in a major, major layoff. Salesforce just hitting now, um, plans to lay off 700 employees uh, after they already cut 10%, so another 1%. Um, and they still have a thousand open jobs. It's really weird that they do that. The whole media meltdown, Dave, has been interesting, right? So you're starting to see um, the business model of media start to plum plummet. This is the frog in boiling water, right? In my opinion, this is long overdue. I forget years ago when we were doing the cube early on. You say, "What do you see?" Search. I see search. Google's going to die soon. Perplexity now making a shot at Google search. I've always said banner advertising, click through advertising, is still good, but that was going to just die a, a longer death. But media journalism, in particular, which we do, is we're all digital, so we're a little bit well well funded. We have a good business model and stable and growing. But old school media is built on banner ads and advertising. And that business is now going away, just like classified ads for the people who are younger. If you're under the age of 30, you might 40, you might not know classified ads is how you found stuff. You open the paper up and you go look for stuff. Now it's all online. You mean the newspaper? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can they, they classify? still exist. They still exist. I'm like, I can't. It's good to have, good to see you doing your homework <laughs> from yesterday's news. Uh, I'm talking about today's news. Classified, classified ads drove the business that moved online. So I think media's the people who didn't transition to online subscriptions are getting screwed, and you're seeing the haves and have-nots. Well, uh, Sports Illustrated gone. L.A. Times just laid off really good group of writers and staff. Um, basically, de whole departments, and some are just shutting down. Huge consolidation. Forbes as a, as a walkout, they're laying off more people. Um, it's just, it, that is a tell sign, this whole digital culture. And I still think it points down to the things we've been talking about, Dave. Productivity, change of user behavior, expectations are changing. The mobile phone changed the game. You know, Facebook used to suck all that, all those dollars out too. So there's no money to be made in journalism. And it's really a problem. Journalism's needed. Now, you know, I think companies like ours that have been born digital first, who have built a journalism model around other revenue streams like sponsorship and data are doing better, right? So um, Wall Street Journal, they made the transition. New York Times, they made the transition. They got on subscriptions early. And I think you're going to see even more consolidation and you're going to see the rise of reputation networks. And so uh, subscriptions pointing to that. And uh, for the people watching want to hear the vision of media, it's going to be less about fake analysts, fake journalists, it's going to be about real journalists, real analysts, real data, and real networks, reputable networks where influence and reputation are important. Some of the most influential people on, in our world have bad reputations. And so I think, you, you know, people are going to make decisions around influencers, around their reputation. What are they known for? Are they just taking the cash? Are they on the payout? So I think this changes disclosures, David, changes everything in the media business. What you're doing, be transparent, and the people who aren't transparent, who are hiding the ball around their views, are going to get challenged, and they'll probably lose business and they'll lose reputation. So, you know, always ask about people's reputation. That's going to see the tell sign of things to come. But journalism, I see it rebooting. 
So I think a whole nother generation is going to go come in and reset it, but it's going to be ugly uh, this year. It's not even January and they got all this, all this, this, this layoffs and companies too. Like I said, budgets are down. So I don't see the economy as solid as everyone else does. So, you know, even Chamath at All In, you know, they talk about how great the economy is. He couldn't even raise capital for a fund and he's got all that action. He tried to raise a billion dollar early stage investment fund due to fundraising challenges. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I was like, yeah, really? So. Well, when did he do this? When did he try to raise? In the summer. Well, I mean, if, if you were an LP and you had an opportunity to invest or just park your money and get, you know, five, six percent in some, you know, fund, not fund, but just money market, right? Why not? Why not take advantage of that? Now that's probably gonna change. I don't know. When you know how these things are. But when the headlines say, oh, things are bad, everybody's like, oh, things are bad. And other things are good. Oh, things are good. And it's never <laughs> as bad as they seem. It's never as good as they seem. You know? <laughs> All right, what's the what's the thing that you learned this week that uh, that that jumped off the page for you this week? Well, what was, what was the what was the what was the um the thing you're watching the most of? Because to me, it's it's the it's the ecosystem uh, in the valley, the startups and the VCs, and 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 um, you're seeing the haves and have nots, the startups that have raised all this capital in 2021 and 2020. Those are the companies that are falling out of the sky, and now the capital market's like, oh, it's the ZERP zero interest rate period um, is over. Yeah, and they didn't make it. They got product market fit that they thought they had. They didn't get it, and then they had all this cash. It's just bleeding out. Other companies on AI, Dave, are overvalued unbelievably. Again, it's an $85 million, billion dollar valuation on a name. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, what does that tell you? It's crazy. Well, I did my predictions this week. And so, you know, obviously looking at the macro spending, obviously spend a lot of time doing that. I think 2024 has got to be the, the, the year of AI ROI. And if it's not, then I think we're going to see tech spending is going to still track the Fed's moves and it's going to be a function of the economy. It's not going to be able to see that kind of gain sharing that we'd like to see. I think cybersecurity, um, I think you're going to continue to see consolidation and at the same time, you're going to continue to see more companies get funded, right? Uh, it was interesting to listen to Eric Bradley who knows a lot of CISOs and he was saying CISOs are much more willing to take a risk, which has surprised me, on new, new startups the new shiny toy than our CIOs. So CIOs, that doesn't surprise me. They're more conservative, but but yeah, consolidation is still a big trend in security, but the consolidators like CrowdStrike and, and Zscaler and Palo Alto Networks, they can't keep up with the oh, oh, <laughs> you know, it's like where the, the, the tribbles, the trouble with tribbles, they're coming out faster than you can consolidate them, you know? So- That's the Star I, Trek I, joke that people might not get, but I get the yeah, tribble, yeah. The tribble <laughs> reference. <laughs> they were these little Furbies that would expand like exponentially and they would grow all over the place and they were very harmless, but they were everywhere. I think, so I think the message in cybersecurity is get back to the basics, yeah. right? Just worry about your basic hygiene. I think that's you know, the, the situation. And I think you're going to see, you know, I was asking you before, prepping for my predictions, more smaller deals, VCs putting in, yeah. you know, six figure kind yeah. of seed rounds versus doing $2 million seed rounds, $5 yeah. million seed yeah. rounds, and series A rounds smaller. And so that's, we've seen a shift there. And I think when I look at the inbound, so John, these are the inbound predictions I got. You say you get a zillion too. Yeah. I print them because I'm old school yeah. and I go through every one of them dominated, of course, by AI right to the roof, but AI, cyber, and data mm -hmm. were the three big areas yeah. you know, that everybody's talking about, that everybody's predicting, and that's where all yeah. the action is, and they're yeah. very much interrelated. I mean, the thing that I looked at this week that's interesting, my conversation with Ed Sim and others uh, on the radar, on the VC community, is the action is high, right? And uh, the deal, the deal com competition for AI deals is high. But there's, there's truly also a lack of understanding around some of the nuances around these deals. Like I talked to some founders that I think have the most incredible application and they can't get an audience. They can't even get a meeting with VCs. You think that's incredible, right? But, like, but I, then it's not translating into the, into, the, into the pattern match. So what's happening is you start to see new deals come in where like only like 1% of VCs will actually understand what the hell they're talking about. And um, that's one company, you have to be an expert on Amazon, Azure, and AI and infrastructure to understand that what they were doing. Like, like that's actually a freaking great deal. Like, I, go, I know two guys you should talk to right now. But if you're an entrepreneur, you're like walking, who do I talk to? 
Okay, and then of course, everyone's AI washing and saying, hey, I got AI. And so the VCs are peddling as fast as they can trying to like vet deals. And how do you do due diligence on a deal when you see a kitty script AI wrapper and you got to dig into it, it takes time. So you're going to see, I think a productivity shift in VCs and how they think about deals. And Ed Sim talked about that significantly. And the, the idea of having network of a community around it, uh, of experts is going to be the vet. The so let me ask you something. You know VCs yeah. you know, better than I do. Remember the Wall Street Journal thing where they throw the darts at the dartboard to pick stocks? Yeah. And they would consistently or very frequently <laughs> outperform the best stock pickers? Yeah. I, I wonder if this is the same thing with VCs. In other words, I'm not saying that they, they, don't, they don't add value, but I'm saying you could probably just throw a dart at the companies and it's the VCs with their ecosystem and their connections and their knowledge, their operational knowledge yeah. to the extent that exists that is really going to make or break the company, you know, you get a Bill Gurley yeah. versus some, you know, kid out of college, you're going to have a better chance of succeeding because he or she has seen it before. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I don't know how they do it. I mean, they What's get- What's the question? Th 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 so is is it more just sort of luck of which company, and it's really all about the execution and the ecosystem and the experience, or is it really just about figuring out, connecting the dots and figuring out where that opportunity is? You know, I, I have an opinion on this. I think a lot of luck plays into it, but it's also access. So in the old days, it's being networked. You, what's the scuttlebutt pattern match? People talk about that pattern match being a negative thing. In some cases, VCs like to talk to each other and they, and they signal and there's a lot of signaling going on. Now with the networks, it's higher signaling. So it's all online, a lot more digital. But if you look at like guys like Pete Sonsini, he used to work with NEA, he's starting his own fund. He's a Cal guy, so he's got all access to the Cal network. Uh, Ed Sim, who I talked to, started Bold Start v VC. Uh, 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 um, the, the workbench guys in New York, who I'm going to meet with next week, um, they all have networks, right? And think about how the Cube has our 18,000 experts in our network. I think you're going to start to see a new digital kind of communication where the formation of these trusted networks will be sharing information at high velocity. So I think the idea of a VC sitting there saying, okay, where's the business plan? And going through the slog of the linear path of how they vet, it's going to be what's hot, Go to a person real quick in real time, text them, look at a deal. You got to have a network and, a, and it does take a village as Ed said, but I think more importantly, you got to have experts. And you go, that guy's full of shit. She's great. Let's go with her. She's got the real deal. Okay, he's okay, but he needs a CTO. So like, you're going to start to see highly accelerated decision-making. And that's why this idea of a solo general partner we talked about before is hot because the decision-making is data-driven, but also intuition. So I think I think that's what I see now, and all the success I see are not incubators per se, but this idea of getting in and helping uh, founders, and, and, and I then, think and getting to a, a yes decision uh, and a no decision as fast as possible, being transparent but, about but, it. But I think this is why the VCs always say, "Well, it's size of market, yes, that's okay. There's some intuition and you know, knowledge there, but it's also they always say, I start with the team, <laughs> right? Because if you get a good team, it's like, you know." Picking horses, right? I mean, you, you, if you're trying to buy a yearling, you know, to, to, at the Saratoga sale or the Keeneland sale, yeah, maybe there's a secretariat in there that anybody could train, you know. But <laughs> but but you can get some some good horses that bad trainers ruin, yeah. Or mediocre horses that good trainers take to the next level, and good jockeys take the next level. So I think that's I think the team is really important. You think about Snowflake, you know. I mean, Muglia, I love Bob Muglia, awesome. Um, got the company and to, to you know way beyond the point where they had product market fit. Slupin came in and goes, "Oh my God, you guys are way beyond the point where you got the product market fit. We got to scale, go to market." You know, and Spicer obviously you know, yeah. orchestrated that. If if that didn't happen, who knows? Yeah, you know, if they would have achieved the escape velocity that they achieved, I, I, I don't know. Maybe I, I, I tell you this idea of helping companies that's added value stuff, and I think that's going to be more the secret, less of the pedigree firm. By the way, pedigree firms usually have a network, like Sequoia has a deep network, NEA's got, still got a deep network. Um, and if companies don't keep that network going, they're going to lose out for the solo and the smaller firms. Um, speeds everything. If you look at all the hot young talent coming into the investment market, they're either got pedigree from a founding themselves or 
huge domain expertise, and then they put the networks together. And that's the ones, and they're also doing their own content. I just saw Bill Gurley and Brad Gerstner from Intimidator trying to do a podcast like, hey, we're trying to experiment. It's an edge in case it doesn't fail. But those guys should do great. They're like big guns. And then you got the- They're the, doing their own podcast? Yeah, they're doing their own podcast. <laughs> but I but I want to hear what they, I think that- They probably got FOMO. No, this is- Because they're like, they're like the, the subs this, for the all in. This right? is, they're, the so B, they're probably like- They're the B team. They're, the B team, but they're, they're probably the, like, you know what? We're just as yeah. good as those guys, and that, by the way, they are. They're the B team. They platoon in. But the, hey, why don't we? We'll start James University podcast. Um, Is it just yeah. themselves, or they have a? I don't moderator. think they'll be like to hear that they're the. Maybe JV. you should be their moderator. Yeah, yeah. I'm a better moderator than Jason Calcanis, but I don't want to compete with him. He's already good. Uh, I'm only kidding. Jason's Jason's better. No, yeah, but I think that's a good sign. The, the idea that Brad Gerster, who and who saw who got the crack probably from the the access to All In. And Gurley, who, who's, by the way, has been prolific blogger. He had a blog called Above the Crowd that was pre-blogging. He always yeah. had post-publishing. They're prolific. And I, that is going to be more the same. So, of course, they're stepping up to the plate. They can do it. They got the data. And uh, Jamin Ball, who's the son of Ben Ball, who I coach Little League with, he's one of the stars over there. He's got a great blog called Clouded Judgment. And this is, this is the new normal. And this is what I'm talking about earlier about reputation. In these communities, if you're publishing... Okay, and you're on camera. I mean, you can see who's got the knowledge. I mean, I see some people on camera in our space, and like you just hear them talk, and you go, "Wow, that's they got no substance. They have they just they're just parroting vendor speak." And so when you look at people's commentary, you say, "Wow, they have no substance. They're just getting paid." That's not going to play long in the long game, right? So you know, guys that are coming in that are pros, you're going to start to see these networks form, and that's going to be the tell sign of real influence. Dave is. What's their engagement look like? Do they have a following? And you can see them talk on camera and they don't really say anything. And so, you know, if you and I did a podcast, hey, bust, hey, bestie, you know, and we just talk to each other, that's not going to fly. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how this market works. You know how I feel about it, John. You just got to bring the data, you got to bring the analysis and, you know, serve your audience. And yeah. that's how you get organic. Yeah, but you're going to start to see groups of people. Like, for instance, those guys go on, Brad and Bill Gurley, they go on the All In. The All In has three pods. Now, Jason does three pods. They're going to, he's got a startup incubator. That's just the new formation. If you're not putting media out, then you're not going to attract it. And then ultimately, if your game's good, you're going to have good, good community. It's not only who, who you know, it's who knows you. All right, Dave, let's wrap this up. Uh, it gets late here on the East Coast. Usually when I'm on the West Coast, it's like two o'clock. I know it gets dark early here in the winters and it's uh, kind of like, it was like, ah, got to go home. All right, so Friday. final thing, playoffs. Niners, Detroit, Ravens, you're thinking of? I think, um, and Chiefs, what's your, what's your take? It's uh, a tough one. So I think the Niners played very poorly last week against Green Bay, but I, I, I liked Green Bay. I think Green Bay was a, a better than most people realized. Yeah. And I had um, I had Green Bay's QB um, in, in my fantasy, so I was kind of watching him all year, and I thought he could do some damage. And it's just one of those improving. But I think the Niners go to the Super Bowl. I mean, I'm kind of rooting for the Niners. I got to say, I, I, I don't know Detroit. Nah, I don't think they're going to get there. I'm wondering, could this be Lamar's year? I've always said he's not a Super Bowl guy. Yeah. He's never going to get there. Not I, never. But I he's, think this he's year, not built I for think, the playoffs. I think he proves the critics and beats Kansas City down. But, you know, you got two good coaches there. You got Harbaugh, the, the brother of, of Jim Harbaugh, I think, John Harbaugh. I, I think the Ravens' and, defense is going to be the difference maker. I do. Yeah. Um, I think they're going to be able to shut down um, Kansas City to the point where they can score enough, enough uh, points to win. I think Lamar is going to score a touchdown. I would, yeah. I would make that bet. I think it's, I think it's, it's, I was uh, going to bet that McCaffrey scored two touchdowns and got a hundred yards. Turns out it was actually 99 I, yards last I, game, but um, I'd, I'd like to see a San Fran Ravens. I, I don't know. I don't really want to see San Fran KC. You know why? <laughs> actually, I kind of always root, almost always root against KC unless I'm betting on them because I don't want to see Mahomes break Brady's records. <laughs> In fact, yeah. Mahomes and um, just broke Brady and Gronk's record last game. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. With uh, so Kelsey. okay, so r r I, I'm voting for the Niners against the Chiefs in an epic matchup. That's what you want to see. Yeah, I mean that I that's probably a better Super Bowl. But you know, I'm a, I I'm like I like defense. I like good defense against a good offense. So Dave, six years ago this weekend, you and I were at the AFC Championship oh, yeah. game in New England uh, yeah. when it was like sub zero. 
Caroline, my daughter, and I had <laughs> pictures. I saw that come up on my Facebook memories. Was my brother at that? Yes. We yeah. had that big shrimp. We had the nice meal. Right. My friend um, Dave Ellison had the tickets for all those years. He would always yeah. invite us. I had, you know. Yes. Uh, we'll be back to football. You know. I'll be in here in the, my sister's place for the weekend. So uh, I'll be watching the Niners here in the Bay Area. I mean, not in the Bay Area, but I'll, I'll be here. So. Great. Yeah, this is good. I, actually, because, yeah. well, actually, during Sundays, you, you have football at 10 a.m., right? Obviously, yeah. the playoffs are later. Next week, I'm going to do the podcast from Pebble Beach. You golfing? Yeah. No, the, the uh, Pro-Am's there. So I'll be there. Uh, Curtis. Oh, you're Davis. not playing? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not playing. I'll be doing a podcast there. Like I said, remote pod from, from, from uh, Pebble Beach, 18th Green. I might be a little soft up there, maybe, Dave. So Nice. Yeah, so disclosure. All right. All right great pod. If you're watching, hey, thanks for listening. Episode 45. Go to siliconangle.com. That's where all of our traffic is. We get over 4 million uh, users hit that site every year. That's the circulation there on our digital uh, platforms where all the content is. The cube.net where you can find the videos where we're going to be next. Check out the cubeai.com. This is our kind of perplexity of the cube. Ask it any questions, check it out. And of course, you're going to see a lot more from cube videos and the shorts and the highlights. A lot more events coming up. We've got Supercut 6 coming up. We've got Mobile World Congress. We're going to be at Mobile World Congress. Let us know. We're going to have a big stage there. Supercomputing this year uh, is going to be renewed. We just got that word. Uh, we'll be at Mobile World Congress and Supercomputing. Big stages there. And of course, all events. Check out our calendar. Thanks for listening and watching. And uh, DM us if you want to hear something, want to see a guest, let us know. Of course, you'll see a lot of content coming out of our Palo Alto and here in our Massachusetts studios. Thanks for watching.